growth of mobile games, what's next is next in creativity and innovation. Um, and let's invite our panel group to the stage. Terry Lee, who is SVP of Emerging Business and General Manager of Games at Crunchyroll. Welcome, Terry. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Back. And Jill Wilson, founder and CEO of Robin Games. Jill. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Saba Ramani, GM of COVID Fashion at EA Mobile. Saba, good to see you. Likewise, happy to be here. And Bao Dong, strategic partner manager from Google. Bao, welcome. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. And our moderator, Chris Younger, president of Eisenberg. Chris, great to have you back. Thanks for having me on down, Ned. Appreciate right. it. Take it away. All right. Well, uh, Certainly has been actually exciting sessions going on today. I am looking forward to exploring with you all the journey going on in creative innovation in the mobile space. Uh, I've been watching some of the other panels. It's interesting, I think Web3 and NFT and blockchain still seem to be very alive and very exciting. I know we might touch a little bit about that today, but with that said, I'd like us to start rolling in uh, with an opening question to Bao. Hello, Bao, welcome, hopefully, got your cocktail or beverage ready to go. Um, one of the things that often I think we experience is where is the space gonna go? Where do we continue to develop uh, and innovate around ideas? Sometimes some theory might, there's no new ideas, it's just an origination of an old one. So when I look into that kind of blue ocean space, you had, you know, you've had a, an incredible journey at Google. You are part of the, the starting journey with AdMob. Uh, continue to develop and work on products and be involved in, in a lot of the experience on the Android platform. Uh, and I'd love to get just a personal perspective on when we think about innovating, creating the mobile space and what type of ecosystems out there for gameplay, game experience, game development, uh, any, any kind of surprises or any insights or any trends you're seeing that could impact the audience today or think about it. And I think that might be a good starting point to where we might go with some of the other panel discussion, but I love some opening thoughts for you on that, if you could. Sure, yeah, and happy to give my opening thoughts and really just, again, happy to be here at the panel. So an interesting trend that I would say that I found for a lot of developers getting into over the past few years is a concept of what I would call genre blending. So years ago, right, in the mobile space, there were some very clear cut genres of it's a match -free puzzle game. It's a hardcore RPG game. It's a base building game. And that was mostly about it. And those are very popular. But I would say, let's call it the past three to four, let's call it past three years, maybe four years. It was, it was interesting to see more of these games come out where they're actually blending these gameplay loops in where I actually didn't think it'd be possible to blend some of these in. But then these either morphed into a very clear genre mashup of, oh, it's a game where you do build a base and you have this RPG element, but by the way, the actual gameplay loop is matching puzzles, which is interesting, right? Because it's it appeals to a more mainstream audience, but it's still a RPG game in a sense, but it was working. Then you got the likes of Puzzles and Dragons and these other game types. And then more recently you have these merge type games where again, it follows the gameplay loop of building the base and whatnot. So it's a bit more of an involved gameplay, which is a lot stickier, right? For users to get into. But again, the gameplay loop is quite simple. You just match the three things together and that's about it, right? So I think it's so innovative in the sense that there are these developers out there that are just willing to try some of these things out where, you know what? Let's just see if these two gameplay loops work together because maybe either there is a market out there that specifically likes that type of blend or maybe we're just introducing a different type of gameplay style to an audience that might be used to just match three or just base building. So I think more of that genre blending would be really great to see. And I think as long as developers come at it with the mindset of either trying something out that maybe the marketplace doesn't know about, or maybe meeting an unmet need of where, you know what, I think a lot of our users would be interested in the idea of having this gameplay loop. Let's just try it or maybe make a new game developing for that. So I think that's the biggest thing that I'm excited about is seeing the rest of these genre blending games come out. And I would really love to see even more compelling examples. So, uh, so glad you asked to see more compelling examples. Cause when I think of genre bending or genre blending, it makes me think about some of the exciting things that are brewing over at Robin games and Jill, I would love to hear more. I think we'd love to hear more about what's going on there. You've taken down some pretty significant funding. 
I know some of that has been publicly uh, press release on that. I know additional funding's there, but when it comes to that type of thinking, was that some of the inspiration happening at Robin Games? Like, give us a little, tip. like what's going on over there and how does it apply to when we think about innovation? I'd love to hear uh, some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. So we are at Robin very interested in not only that genre melding, but really the melding of taking it one step further of games and what's not traditionally considered games, but might be more considered apps, also commerce and social media. And our premise is really that play is happening everywhere. And some people might not even look at it as play at this point, might not consider themselves gamers, but they're interested in creativity. They're interested in expressing themselves and they would love to do so in a more play oriented environment uh, that mobile gaming can provide. So what we're making are lifestyle games that bring all of these real world elements in. Some people might consider it an app with gameplay elements. We're fine with that. Some people might consider it a game with some app elements. We're equally fine with that. And we see this crossover of the future of gaming, especially for the demo of women, um, of being a really blended space where people don't have to associate themselves as gamers, uh, but can be playing games really intensely as somebody who does associate themselves as a gamer would. Mm. Do you want to, uh, can you share a little bit about, or I don't want to, you tell me it's not appropriate of, is the, because I don't think Robin Games has announced a game yet or maybe shared, is there anything you can break here and share what maybe specifically how that's being applied in, a, in an actual something that might be coming out soon? Or no, not sure, I'd love to. So <laughs> later on this summer, uh, we will be coming out with our first game, which is very design based and to speak to uh, the kind of generalities I was saying before, you know, we're working with, as I know Covet does as well, a lot of real world brands, uh, 110 brands are involved in our game and there's a real crossover between commerce and the gameplay that's happening. And we're also working with over a hundred influencers um, to start out in the game. And we'll be working with many more to also bring in the social space into the game and really create this hybrid where people are designing, uh, but also bringing in influences from outside the game into it. I'm gonna uh, thank you, Jill, for that. And I know there's more to that. And we might get to that later in the session here. Jill, when I think of, uh, I think that was a good softball pitch on over to you on what's going on with over at Covet. So the area that I'm fascinated and you've joined the team, you're, you're inheriting a brand that's, uh, I think when we were talking earlier, you mentioned it being one of the longest running fashion mobile games in the marketplace, uh, nine plus years running. But I would be interested in Jill and Arsaba as you're moving into that experience, how is social there's, there's social in the real world, right? The tangible aspects of the platform and then the virtual world or the gaming world and how you're, how you're experiencing now that you're working in that brand, working in with that community, how they're interacting and how you're balancing the two in an ecosystem that you might've has been built before you arrived, but you're learning how to work in that space. And I'd love to learn more about, um, you know, when I think about the fashion house, and I think about some of the things happening in COVID. Can you can you speak a little bit about that ecosystem and how to nurture it, and what innovations you should be thought about when thinking about community and bringing those the experience together between the real world and the actual gaming world? Absolutely. Um, so, it, really quickly, first of all, COVID is actually eight years old. Our ninth birthday is next month, which is very very exciting. Um, and I'm only uh, 21, so I'm with you there. <laughs> For a game to, to really survive and thrive with such an active community for, for that period of time, it's really a testament to the strength of the community, right? Um, we view social as very, very important and very, very additive to the experience. The game itself has its own notion of guilds through these fashion houses where players can connect and share stories and ideas. Um, but we noticed on Covet that that actually started to grow outside of the application and, and permeate the real world. Um, and, and when we noticed things like that happening, like groups of players in fashion houses getting together IRL, we thought, well, well we should really help facilitate that. And that's how certain um, initiatives of ours like CovetCon, which is our fan event, 
um, were born. And I, I think it's important for developers to really acknowledge and meet their players where they are, lean into the tools and the trends that are part of their lives and find really authentic ways to, to connect the community and really facilitate the love of the game and the spread of ideas through those things. Social media and um, you know, social video have just created uh, more platforms and more reach for that, that notion to spread out. So it's, it's all part of um, how, to, how to harness the energy of that community and really deliver content they care about over time. And I, and I love the recent article that came out with the journey and the investment you're making around DE&I and looking at acknowledging body types, looking at different fashion types and exploring and in, in, in bringing that to the model. So being representative and reflective of your, of your community, especially in a lifestyle product, how important is that? And, and where do you see in terms of retention and just driving an overall holistic experience? Yeah, it's, it's hugely important. I, a couple of things I would say, first of all, is in terms of DEI, we're only just scratching the surface of what's possible and achievable. And, and this is a, a huge area of focus for us that we intend to lean into far more, largely because we think it's important for people to find themselves in our applications. Um, people play games for a variety of different reasons. Sometimes it's purely fantasy-based. You want to escape reality. And sometimes you want to lean into reality and kind of play with games that shape and mirror that experience. Um, what's important to us is really making sure that we're representing the entirety of the spectrum and that no matter where players come in, they feel like they can find themselves. Uh, EA Mobile's broader vision is really to inspire the world to play, right? Not just to inspire certain pockets of gamers to play. So while we might have product offerings that appeal to certain um, user groups more than others, we want to make sure that even within those, they're as diverse and inclusive as possible so that anyone that actually wants to connect with the content doesn't feel shut out by it. Yeah, I think the uh, there's both that as a as a a product and an experience to create inclusion, but there's also that as an, an industry. And I want to just take a moment, a side moment here, a sidebar with the group here, and maybe Terry, I would love to have an opening note, but I think I'd like to hear from all of you, which is we're we're at a, a, a I think a critical point where we recognize the value. Um, I went to the three percent. I've been attending the three percent conference the last couple of years virtually, but in person, and knowing that in an organization where diversity is driven, looking at women leadership that uh, provides better performance and, and, and data shows that when you're aspiring or driving towards that, you are ultimately are creating a better, not only company, but also a better experience. And in that journey, you know, the commitment to do that, is there any techniques, anything that all of you are using to help continue to champion that and drive that and expand it. I know each of the companies you're at, that's part of a corporate initiative, but I'd love to hear anything that you've been applying or driving yourself. And so uh, just, a, just a quick line for the group to pull from to know uh, it's easier, it, it's not as easy said as done as you move into creating diversity and drawing from pools, but I'd love to hear the feedback of, of how you're driving it. And so maybe actually Bao, can you a quick, quick, I'd love to know how, how you're approaching over at Google and driving that but then the rest of the group. I'd like to just get a little, little sense on that. Bao, are you comfortable starting there? Sure, yeah, happy to start. So even though it is DEI in general is a very big corporate initiative, I think the beauty of just Google, even though we're very large, we do try to make sure that a lot of the main values that we have as a company do get distilled down to the areas that we're working in and gaming is a huge focus. And it was one of the things I noticed working in the industry for several years is it was, especially a few years ago, it was very rare, unfortunately, to see really, um, really prominent really prominent leaders, especially with a more diverse background and especially just with women in general. So it was nice to see over the years, us take it a bit more seriously alongside with the industry. So one of the big things we've been doing on a more smaller scale is working with a lot of our top partners in the advertising marketing space all across Google since you know we touched with Google Play, Google AdMob, Google Ads. And we would just either have these official or what we would call not unofficial, but more spontaneous panels, just really generate the discussion, have the ideas flow between leaders in these different com companies to talk a bit more about the initiatives that they're doing. And as a result, not only do our partners learn from each other, but we as a company are learning too. Because look, we're not perfect, even though we have these different values, we still are keeping score of our own DI metrics and there's still room to improve. But I think that's one of the biggest things that you know I have the joy of personally seeing with the relation of the work that my team and I do is just having our partners work together, learn from each other, and we learn too. And just as long as a discussion flows around, I think that's where the great ideas and innovation comes from. And that's what we could help facilitate. Cool. Terry, any thoughts on that coming to you? 
Yeah, you know, I think for us at Crunchyroll and Sony, what we're trying to do in terms of more inclusion is we start with the content side, right? Because at the end of the day, we are a content driven service, whether it's games, whether it's streaming, whether it's merch. So we're trying to figure out how better ways to incorporate um, content that appeals to a broader um, base of users, right? Uh, potentially hard to reach or non traditional users that would have traditionally come to anime. And I think in that respect, we also um, have shifted our sort of overall interactive strategy to bifurcate more of a, you know, traditional gaming route, right, where, where it's traditional anime fans, but also a separate route where we're looking at new genres, new segments, targeting um, audiences that are not traditionally thought of as gamers or anime audiences, and we want to try to bring them into the fold and serve them on a holistic ecosystem. That's how we're trying to figure out how to expand our, our diversity. I do want to, I, I love that, and I want to come back to you on the, uh, actually on the IP and growth, because uh, I think there's some value there in terms of how to think about creative innovation. But Saba and Jill, into the you know coming off of Bao's note, on it's we're constantly learning and trying to build that muscle and create it. What are just a note, continue on note around the DI and kind of looking at inclusion, welcoming women and trying to open up the ecosystem, providing opportunities. One of the things I learned early on was stop trying to necessarily hire for the job description and try to actually hire for the talent and write the job description to celebrate that talent and try to rework the way you're thinking. But what, what tips or insights have you experienced in terms of trying to welcome more in and, and try to drive that type of diversity and, and, and I think melting pot that's needed to have a high performing company? Any, any, Saba, please. I definitely have thoughts and Jill, I'd love to hear your results. So, but I think I'll keep it short and sweet. I think yeah. for me, the, the really simple thing is that like, you have to show up, you have to show up every day, you have to commit to it. It's very easy for organizations to talk about DEI. And in fact, they all are right. But you have to put it in practice every day, every every meeting you attend where you notice the, the vocal minority may have been more authentically or intuitively on point um, than, than the louder people in the room. Um, Every stack of resume that crosses your desk, you have to sort of ask for where is the diversity in this candidate pool? Can I get those bubbled up to the top? You have to actually make it happen in practice. And that's really the hardest part with DEI. It's academically something we all endeavor to do, right? But you have to actually show up and commit to it every day. That's, that's Jill, please. I agree totally. And at Robin, we are uh, 50 percent over 50 percent women across the board so team management team and board and I'd say what happens as a result of that is that uh, it's naturally a very uh, interesting environment in terms of different ideas and creative thoughts being brought to the table that are reflective of the audience that we're serving um, and just trying to make an effort, as Saba was saying, on a daily basis to make sure everybody feels included and heard is a big principle of our company. Uh, I love it. And you uh, have to show up every day. I guess a great line, Saba, and a commitment. Because when I think of creative innovation in the mobile context or any topic, this is, this is a top five. If you want to start driving creative innovation, Diversify the very people that are bringing your ideas to the table. All right, cool. All right, Terry. All right, Crunchyroll. Incredible journey. Asaba, I know, is alumni, so she has all the deep secrets. Is going to keep you honest, Terry. The idea of creating a house of IP, and there's an incredible IP over there. And I think about when you're creating and innovating, gaming's, games and games are great stories, great character, great narrative. But sometimes they're not a completely slam dunk as a transmedia experience, a term I remember we used to use 10 years ago in building this house of brands and developing that area. And I know you have your own experience and manage your own brands, but what would be a good coaching note or good insight in terms of when you're building IP and how to leverage that in a creative and innovative way? Is it starting just from a gaming first pillar and building an audience and growing out from there? Or are there other things we should, you should think about when developing your IP and where are your, the audiences you wanted to live with and perform on? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a pretty, um, you know, meaty topic. I think from, from our experience, you know, a lot of it starts with having um, the proper vision set in the beginning, right? Before you dive into a game, before you even dive into IP, sort of understand, you know, what you hope to do with the overall IP to reach the audience. And that really informs the, the strategies you take. Um, to your point, gaming can be a really rich kind of narrative um, vehicle, um, but you have to have sort of the foresight to develop it, right? And so for us, you know, um, a lot of it can start with gaming. A lot of it's 
for us starts with streaming, start with the content side. Um, and we really have to think about how deep to develop the narrative, the characters, um, how, you know, how many seasons, how many um, months of live ops we want to be pushing this game out for, how long of a narrative we want to be um, pushing for, and to that degree, um, how broad of an audience we're trying to get and then beyond the initial set. And all of that informs the way we think about creating uh, IP, whether it's for games, whether it's for um, a video. And then we try to make sure that we create the, the IP and the, the narrative in a way that can see value in all forms of media participation, right? Whether it's video, whether it's um, comic books, manga, whether it's games, whether it's merchandise, we want all of these flywheel components to add to the overall adoption of the IP. So real quick follow on that one. So I think of the flywheel, a really great statement. And you have a, a heavy influence of manga, Japan. You're moving into North America, moving into European territories. You've got some incredible platform to which to distribute and reach. Where, where, does, it, where does it start at when it comes to audience? You have, and I think this can be very applicable regardless of genre or genre bending or blending. Are you looking at the IP when I look at Attack of Titans or Naruto, when you're developing and moving in that space, is there one medium that begets another medium that helps you reach a larger audience? Another way of saying it is some people may think some of the IP and Crunchyroll is very niche, very focused in a certain audience. Yet you as an executive probably believe in thinking about there's a very wide audience that can join this, but they might consume it in different ways or I'm looking for it to introduce a larger audience. How do you think of audience in that flywheel in driving engagement within it? Is it a bottom funnel conversion or is it really a top funnel brand awareness? How should we think of the flywheel and how to adopt the IP, you know, thinking about the kind of brands you're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, right? I think it's sort of an evolution. I think um, the, the genre of anime, and I'm sure there's a lot of niche entertainment genres that start there. It starts with, con it started with content. And that's not to say that's the direction we're taking now, but it started with content. And it was heavily influenced by targeting, you know, certain segments of that audience. I think nowadays what we're transitioning more to is, um, to your point about that top versus bottom, we want to understand Different audiences engage with your IP through different mediums and different starting points. Not everyone starts touching Attack on Titan or Naruto through the show, right? Some people get exposed to it through merchandise because they see it on a black backpack, they see it on a t-shirt, it piques their curiosity. Some people see it in merchandise, some people see it through a game. And we wanna make sure, like our job is to make sure that all representations of the IP we represent that's consumer facing, have a valuable way to lead them back to the holistic ecosystem. So if you start with a game, we want to make sure it's a game that um, piques your interest beyond more than just the game loop or the mechanics. We want to we want that game to have enough content, enough depth to pique your interest to learn more about the overall IP in the universe. Same thing with the t-shirt, like right? have, having a lot of different designs. It's a little bit harder with physical merchandise, but the goal is to really get you interested to learn more. So then you consume all aspects and representations of that content. And now that's what gets you the maximum enjoyment of the IP in the flight wheel. Cool. So that actually makes me want to go to Jill and Sava here. And I actually and bow all of you. Man, I'm really confused. I don't quite understand audience segmentation anymore. It seems to be different terminology between hyper casual, casual, core. Uh, we talked earlier, I'm Zanga, it's been recently purchased by 2K. There's a lot of movement into bringing mobile more into everyone's ecosystem. EA is heavily invested in this space. So when I think of just audience and understanding the audience mechanic and the type of game you're making and what comes with the risk and reward, creative and innovation between these audience sets, can you break down or someone share a little bit about what's the definition of a hyper casual or a casual type of product experience in today's kind of marketplace? Anyone want to take a first whack at that? If not, I'm gonna have Jill go first. Jill, please. I'm happy to. <laughs> so a casual, a hyper casual game is typically a very, very snacky game. You have it in one session, that's the entire game. And it monetizes through ads. That's essentially what a hyper casual game is. A casual game is typically considered one that's also snacky, not quite as snacky, but you can have a lot of short sessions. You could play it online at Starbucks. Um, and there are certain genres that go into that. Typically, 
um, animal, like puzzle games, things of that nature. Um, a lot of time people think those are the games that women like to play the most. I will comment on that. Uh, then there's mid-court games, which are, you know, typically games that have deeper gameplay and then hardcore games, which supposedly have the most intense gameplay and the most intense user behavior. Uh, what we're noticing at Robin is that our players in soft launch are exhibiting much more mid-core behavior, even though it's considered a casual topic, which I think is really interesting that the player behavior isn't necessarily associated with the category that the game is in. And then I'll make it even more confusing and say, not only are we going for gamers and people who are traditionally gamers, but we're actually targeting another persona of people who are the Pinterest users and the lifestyle lovers who, you know, we position our game as basically a more interactive, creative version of Pinterest. If you could step into your mood board, what would that look like? So we're going after people who don't fall into any of those categories, but we think could be brought in directly into mid-core behavior, um, which I think even a couple of years ago, people would say that's crazy. Um, but I think that people are used to more intense experiences on their phone the behavior that casual players have towards games a lot of times isn't casual at all. It's actually quite intense, um, but we're still using this terminology to describe these different types of games. Interesting. The uh, Saba, what is is? Do you consider the play experience you have right now to be a, a mid-core or a casual type experience? Go like, what's the? How do you how do you think of that audience? How do you think of your fan, your your consumer? It's equally complicated, I would say. It's the nomenclature is failing us, right? Because the player base thinks of themselves, they identify a certain way, their behavior, the way they monetize, operate a certain way. And, and our product is really evolving over time. I think that's the important thing to note is that as developers, you have to continue to evolve along with your audience, right? You, the, the business model can change to the extent that the product will tolerate. The player behaviors can be changed to the extent that the player base will tolerate. But you sort of have to to meet in the middle and make it authentic. I just don't know that calling, you know, a game like Covet casual, hyper casual or mid core makes a lot of sense. It's it's a more complicated question than that. And I think as a whole, the industry is going to change to rename some of this, uh, rethink some of these definitions because what was considered niche is absolutely not niche when you look at the statistics and numbers anymore, right? There's been kind of an inflection point and we haven't really caught up with our terminology to reflect that. The uh, well, at this point, then, Bao, after this session, I'm leaving. I'm going to turn on my Firebase. I'm going to start logging into the app and I'm going to start breaking down my audience and I'm going to start uh, using your tool set to drive an audience. What am I going to experience today? How, when you're meeting, you know, you're dealing with a ton of developers, you're you know, a ton of clients. I know you're at the front seat in a lot of these areas. How are you coaching them through the ecosystem or what are the thought processes you go into it? when talking about trying to reach audiences in a meaningful way? Yeah, great question. Thanks for that softball there, including <laughs> Firebase. So I think some of the biggest things that I try to help coach developers, whether they are just starting off or whether they already have quite a few games, but they're launching a new one or want to improve their existing one. The biggest thing is to just to really understand how, first of all, everything is connected. So I think that's one of the biggest things I notice sometimes that developers tend to forget, especially if they happen to grow really fast, right, is it's very easy to have these artificial silos come up when you start having your UA teams get really interesting ideas and do their own thing, which is a little bit different, though, than what the monetization teams are doing or what the creative team is doing or what the design team is doing, right? So the most meaningful interactions I usually have, and this is where Firebase is very natural, is because the SDK that we have released before and continue to improve on offers a lot of tools for developers to handle all aspects of the, not just the development of the game, but also of the growth of it, right? So that's why it's pretty initially confusing at first because people ask, what does Firebase do? And then you look at the web page and there's about 14 to 16 different things that Firebase does. And we try to do a better job of organizing all of it, but it can seem pretty daunting. But the reason why it has all those things is because we knew from the get-go as Google is, look, 
app development is a very involved process. And we want to make sure that we have something out there in the market that works with everything. It's not just a solution that does this thing well specifically, but can tie into analytics, which feeds into UA, which feeds into monetization, which feeds into development, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we designed Firebase that way. And that also is then the bit of advice I would give developers is make sure your teams are talking to each other. Because even in these really small interactions that my team does, for example, when we're working with the UA teams and providing some feedback on creatives, we really encourage to have the design team for the creatives come into the meeting and offer some feedback. And it gets surprising sometimes when some of these partners would say after the meeting, oh yeah, that was actually the first time in the while that we've talked to our own creative team. And I just kind of give them a shocked look when I say, well, why aren't you meeting with them You know, every couple of weeks or month, it seems like there would be some really fruitful discussions to talk a bit more about what creatives are working well, what are users really gravitating towards in the game. And the creative team go to the design team and say, hey, by the way, we're using a lot of these creatives in our UA campaigns. Users are really liking this. Maybe we should consider thinking about a roadmap and making sure we can highlight more of these features or expand on them in the newer versions of the game, right? So there's a lot of beautiful things that happen when you just break down the walls and just have make sure different parts of the team talk to each other. And I understand the irony because Google's a gigantic company. Trust me, we're working on that too. But that was the biggest thing I would say in terms of really my advice to really build a great product in the ecosystem. And that's really why Firebase is built the way it's built to incorporate all of that. There is a, I know there's constant updates going on there. And so being able to check that out, uh, meet with your local friendly rep about afterwards, uh, you get, there's, there's great tools at your disposal. But you mentioned something interesting in your dialogue around creativity. And I always think of creative in two ways. I think of media as creative, right? All the touch points you go on it. And then there's the creative itself. And it was hard when talking with all of you where the dialogue of the role influencers play today as a creative or innovative way to drive reach. Not to say that what we just talked about isn't exciting, but the influencer marketplace is certainly creating a shift and where time is spent and where time is spent, therefore the investment comes with it. And there are tools out there, Tubular, Tracker, Tagger, others that are pulling down data. It's still being, it's still being refined for sure. Ion as well on our side, trying to work through and, and create that always on program around influencers. But what I'm interested in from the group here is how you're thinking of influencers and, and a way to reach audiences and what is your expectation? Is it an acquisition? Is it a transaction? Is it content that feeds to own and earn? Is it something else? Is it game development actually helping create a product that is that first reviewer there? They're now the PR team. The embargo goes to the influencer, not to the press. I, I like, so I'm really interested in the thought process of how influencers play a role in your system that goes beyond just marketing. It might be part of just the overall always on ecosystem, especially with the type of products we've talked about today. So perhaps uh, Saba, I'd like to start with you because I think of the type of content that's coming and, and how it's shared and how it's recognized but I love a fast follow from the, the group here on influencers and the role they've been playing in, in how you're innovating and creating within the marketplace. I think there's a very obvious application, especially in a post IDFA world to lean mm. into influencers as a means of um, driving installs, right? Running campaigns, driving installs for your game outside of traditional UA. That's very like first level surface engagement with influencers. I think the potential beyond that is huge. And that's one of the giant areas of opportunity in my mind. Um, of course, like, you know, the metaverse and NFTs and Web3 and all this is really interesting as forward facing technology of where's innovation going to come from. But just looking at what's happening now with the influencer economy, I would say the creator economy, the shift in um, engagement going from necessarily having to be active engagements to like passive engagements. I think Twitch is a great example of this, the amount of people that play certain games versus watch them on Twitch. I mean, there's so much to be learned, so much cross-pollination between those industries that can be directly applied to a gaming model. Um, and I think this is a huge area of opportunity for innovation moving forward. Uh, I look forward to running more experiments in Covet and beyond with it personally, and I'm sure others probably feel the same way. Well, I think I heard Jill mention Pinterest and knowing that uh, nine out of 10 people use Pinterest and get inspired to buy things, I think uh, there's been 454, 454 million active users, 3 billion pins saved, 6 billion boards created. 
85% of, of pinners have bought something based on pins. Truly influencer platforms, even like a Pinterest uh, ecosystem, those that are active in it are really incredible at recommending influence and driving it. But Jill, how does, does influencers play a part within the business model or, or thinking about the innovation behind the, the, the games you're, you're creating? Definitely. In both, as Saba was saying, from an acquisition side, I mean, in the post-IDFA world, I think we're all kind of looking for other ways to grow our audience based and influencers are a great channel for that. But also, we're really baking them into the experience of the game. And our hope with that is not only that they bring audience into the game, but that people who are in the game get interested in them and start following them for the first time and that it goes both ways so that people view the game as an inspiration platform on a bunch of levels, including, oh, what type of design influencers or other interesting creative people should I be looking out for? I think in a lot of ways that's relatable to Pinterest in the sense that People are looking to figure out, oh, who are my friends interested in? Who are new people that I can follow, new trends I can follow, new products I can follow? And we're trying to facilitate that both ways. Love it. Love it. And what I'm hearing too from the group is the idea that influencers isn't just a transaction by which to convert for install. It's really an opportunity to build a relationship that feeds in with this kind of game as a service mentality and how they're actually one in one with that consumer journey. So Terry, the, um, I'm sure you, you have an opinion on influence or I'd like to get your opinion on where to drive it through is you're, you're dealing with some incredible IP that I'm assuming the influencer and the audience loves to get access to and have uh, insight on and, and be on the ground floor perhaps of what's coming next. And when I think about uh, the role influencers might play in your world, is it really around uh, providing them first look access into uh, the ecosystem of product? Or are you thinking of it as a way to just drive new innovation and development for products because the influencers are giving you inspiration of where to take it, how to create new content? W what, how does that balance for you when you have a, 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 a really ambitious core that's probably looking for information all day long? Yeah, um, I think influencers for us play two pivotal roles, right? One is being a, a niche genre. Um, we often partner with influencers that uh, we know have a different following segment uh, or profile than our traditional IP. So it introduces the IP to a new set of audiences. I think the second um, role is that, you know, a lot of the influencers that we work with, a lot of the partners that we work with, they, they are act as um, partner content creators, right? And we want them to be creating content organically to driving interest um, towards the community. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can use the word first look because that sort of depends on the IP um, and the partner, the publishers that we work with, but we certainly try to get them more involved in understanding what's coming down the pipe or um, what potential there is to get involved. And if in return, they, they um, you know, naturally and organically create content and help us, you know, uh, generate excitement in the community, we see that as a resounding success. Uh, I remember the last Comic-Con I went to, uh, I think the front row was not reserved for press. It was reserved for the influencers <laughs> to get up there and get down there. Yeah, um, yeah. anime and comic space have a huge, huge segment for influencers. They, uh, yes, as a fanboy myself. Okay, uh, there is some questions that have come in and one's been in the China chat area where I, I, I think where I'd like to go, one of the questions feed into, I, I think one of the topics included for you all, which is this idea of advancement. I mean, I, I get, where we're at today with web and blockchain and, and NFT. And there's been a lot of other panels that have been hitting on this topic. And that's fine if we go in there as well. But when it comes into the idea of business modeling, uh, whether it's games as a service, free to play, whether it, it, is there something new coming around the horizon about, you know, think of your business modeling this way or in innovation where, you know, actually, uh, uh, you know, for both Jill and Saba, your products, you know, AR is, going to be a critical feature moving forward because of fashion or environment. We want to collect that data in a way and where we're seeing that tipping point go when you think of our phones of Pokemon and Niantic and some of the areas they're doing with AR and pushing that. So the general question is tapping into innovation in the ecosystem around us 
and where your head goes. And it might be separate from just the, the very brands you're servicing right now, but it piques your interest because that's just what you're enthusiastic about. I, I just welcome any open thoughts from, from the whole group here. And maybe uh, Bao, I'll have you maybe start first and think of that area, but then welcome the rest of, to chime in, please Bao. Sure, yeah, when it comes to just business models and understanding you know, what should your game have? What does your game have now? What do you want to incorporate? My perspective is a bit unique in the sense that I've worked um, at Google for a few years alongside these other different teams, right? So I now have a better understanding of if a game wants to incorporate in-app purchases. I know a bit more about like the Google Play platform side of it. If they want to integrate in-app ads, for example, that's where the ad mob side of it and of course Google ads as well. So my typical answer to that or the things I think about is because there is a lot of innovation happening with developers understanding that their audience is not just one singular unified profile, they play their games a different way, they want to contribute revenue to the developers a different way. And by the way, this is very different in one country versus other countries, right? So my biggest advice is, in a way that makes sense for your own games, try to come at it with an open mind of diversity when it comes to business models, because the data is there, right? When you're when you have a game that has a, and a purchases, most of the time, that's going to be a very small segment of your population maybe about 20% or less, whatever the numbers happen to be. But there's still the 80 or so percent that still very much like to play your game. They're probably logging in every day. And maybe it's not in that purchase, but they might want to have another way to show their support for the game, right? So a lot of developers that I find do this really well is having these multiple business models or revenue models come in and they do it in such a way where it makes a lot of sense for their game, where it doesn't feel so intrusive, where they're just suddenly throwing in ads and oh, suddenly retention is you know impacted and whatnot. It's not easy to get right the first time, but as long as you stay true to what your audience is, you follow the data, you have your teams talk to each other. There's a lot of really great games out in the market now that just are very intelligent with how they do it with this brilliant combo of in-app purchase, subscription, in-app ads. It's, it just works really well. So that's just my perspective on that. Would you say COVID fashion might be one of those types of examples? I'm just asking, like, do you have a reference of a specific game you put out there as, a, as a one to indicate what you're re referencing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's especially like have a fashion, I feel like the other market uh, games I've seen on the market, I think just generally speaking, the developers that do a really good job of understanding, okay, here's my entire audience, not everyone's gonna be doing this thing. So let's make sure we have an experience to include this other portion of the audience that wants to support us as well. As long as you stick with that, I think just developers are really catching on to the idea now. And there's just a lot of different models out there, right? Whether it's a subscription, whether it's in-app purchase, in-app ads, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah, love it. I know we're come. I know we got about two minutes, so I'd love to get uh, each of you to get some parting words on that same topic. So Saba, I'm pitching it over to you. I think I would echo about what you said. Like, authenticity is really key, right? There's no shortage of new technologies or no lack of other business models that we could like look to from other industries that might inform what we want to do within games. But it's really just about what's going to resonate, make sense for your audience. Um, I'm interested, of course, in like NFTs. I'm interested in the metaverse. I'm interested in AR technology all through the lens of fashion, right? Because we're at this moment in time where there's kind of this convergence of fashion games and technology and you have the intention of the brands and they all care right now. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a direct application that's going to make sense for our audience at this moment in time. So it's just about like understanding what's available and connecting the dots in a really authentic way. Um, and that's, that's probably as much as I should say. <laughs> I think authentically next year, we're going to be at the Met Gala and we'll all dress appropriately, sponsored by Usopp. That's what we're doing next year. Jill, quick, any fast follow thoughts on that? Well, honestly, I just agree with what both Val and Saba said. It's about authenticity and about creating the experience for the user that's in your game. I think that's where people start to get in trouble when they start to apply the flashy new technology or business model to an audience. Um, that isn't ready for it or not the right fit for it. And I think as long as you're just thinking with your audience first, as a principle in everything, if you're thinking with your audience first, you make the right decisions. Cool. Terry, bring us home. Uh, I would echo what everyone said here. Um, the only things I can add are from our perspective, um, we don't want to confuse the user, right? So while there's always new ways to, to figure out how to get them engaged on the monetization side, we want to make sure that it makes sense in the context of how they engage with our games and our apps. So. Love that. Ned, anything you want to add? I, I've got more questions. I keep going, but uh, Ned, are we, uh, if you're there, I want to make sure we're being mindful of the overall programming. 
Yeah, we, we, we are at the end of time right on the dot, too, which shows uh, how efficient you guys are. And uh, this has been really engaging. And, and um, Chris, you, you always do a great job moderating, but uh, it's, it's uh, we really do appreciate that. And Terry, Saba, Bao, Jill, all your insights were, were extremely helpful. And to the audience, uh, always appreciate the comments and the, and the engagement. Um, so this will wrap it up, folks. Um, have a great day and uh, join us at the top of the hour for our next panel, which will touch on the topic of Hollywood in games and storytelling and franchise building that emanates out of uh, out of gameplay. So, all right. Have a good one. Be big. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone.